I've always preferred working nights. There's something about the stillness of a hospital at 2 a.m. when even the lights seem to dim that I find oddly comforting. Maybe it's because there's no one around, no bustling doctors, no chattering visitors, just a few nurses quietly doing their rounds. It's just me, my mop, and the hum of the fluorescent lights. I've been the janitor at St. Joseph's for over a decade now, and I've seen all sorts of things. Drunk patients, frantic families, and once, a raccoon in the supply closet. But nothing, not even the weirdest of my experiences, compares to what happened last October. It started on a Tuesday at the beginning of my shift. I was pushing my cleaning cart down the west wing hallway, wiping down the windows and making sure everything was spotless. As I turned the corner by the oncology department, I caught a glimpse of something out of the corner of my eye. A little girl, maybe eight or nine years old, standing at the end of the hallway. She was pale, with dark hair that hung limp around her shoulders, and she wore a faded, white dress. I blinked, and she was gone. I thought nothing of it at first. Kids wander around hospitals all the time, usually with their parents, and maybe this one was just a patient or a visitor. But when I asked the nurses on duty if they'd seen a little girl, they just shook their heads and went back to their paperwork. That was the first time. The second time, it was a few nights later, and she was there again. Same place, same time, just before 3 a.m. staring at me with these huge, dark eyes. This time, she didn't disappear when I blinked. Instead, she turned and slowly walked around the corner, her bare feet silent on the tile floor. I called out, but she didn't stop. I hesitated, then went after her, but by the time I rounded the corner, she was gone. The hall was empty. I started seeing her every night after that, always at the same time. 3 a.m. like clockwork. She'd appear at the end of the hallway, linger for a few seconds, then turn and disappear. I tried everything to figure out who she was. I asked around, checked the patient registry, even dug through the hospital's security footage, but there was nothing. No one else ever saw her, and there was no trace of her on the cameras. It was as if she only existed for me. One night, curiosity got the better of me, and I decided to follow her. I'd been mopping the floors, as usual, when I felt that familiar chill run down my spine. I looked up, and there she was, standing at the end of the hallway. I left my cart behind and started walking toward her, my footsteps echoing in the silence. She turned and walked around the corner, and I quickened my pace, determined not to lose her this time. But when I turned the corner, I found myself somewhere else entirely. The bright, sterile hallway of St. Joseph's was gone, replaced by dimly lit, narrow corridors with peeling wallpaper and flickering lights. The air was thick, heavy with the scent of mildew and something metallic, something that made my stomach turn. I stopped, trying to get my bearings, but nothing about this place felt right. It looked like a hospital, but not any hospital I'd ever seen. The walls were covered in grime, and the floors were cracked and stained. I could hear faint, distant whispers, the kind that seemed to come from everywhere and nowhere at once. For a moment, I thought I was dreaming. I pinched myself hard, but the pain was real. This was real. I continued down the hallway, my heart pounding in my chest, and there she was again, the little girl in the white dress. She was standing in front of a door, her tiny hand resting on the doorknob. She looked up at me, and for the first time, she spoke. Help them, she whispered, her voice barely audible. Then she opened the door and stepped inside. I hesitated, every instinct telling me to turn around and run, but something compelled me to follow her. As I stepped through the doorway, I was hit by a wave of cold air, and the scene before me made my blood run cold. It was a large, dimly lit room filled with rows of beds, and on each bed lay a patient, restrained and unmoving. Some were staring blankly at the ceiling, while others were thrashing against their restraints, their mouths open in silent screams. The room reeked of antiseptic, and the sound of faint, distorted music played from an old gramophone in the corner. It was a lullaby, one I remembered from my childhood, but there was something off about it, something that made my skin crawl. I turned to the little girl, but she was gone. Instead, I saw a man standing at the far end of the room, 
dressed in an old-fashioned doctor's coat. He was writing something in a ledger, completely ignoring the chaos around him. I wanted to call out to ask what was happening, but my voice caught in my throat. Then he looked up, and I saw his face. It was twisted, not quite human, with eyes that were too small and a mouth that stretched too wide. He smiled at me, a slow, sickening grin, and I felt a chill run down my spine. You shouldn't be here, he said, his voice echoing unnaturally in the room. This is not your place. I turned and ran, my footsteps echoing through the empty halls as I tried to find my way back. Every corridor looked the same, and no matter how many turns I took, I couldn't escape. It was like I was trapped in a maze, with the walls closing in around me. The whispers grew louder, more frantic, until they were all I could hear. Finally, after what felt like hours, I stumbled upon a set of double doors. I pushed them open, and I was back in St. Joseph's, back in the bright, sterile hallway I knew so well. I looked around, disoriented, and saw my cleaning cart right where I'd left it. It was as if no time had passed at all. I didn't see the little girl again after that night, but I still feel her presence. Sometimes when I'm alone in the hallway, I catch a glimpse of white out of the corner of my eye, and I hear faint whispers like a distant echo. I've tried to forget, to convince myself that it was all just a dream, but I can't shake the feeling that there's something I'm missing, something I was supposed to see. I did some digging, and I found out that before it was St. Joseph's, this building used to be a mental asylum back in the 1930s. There were rumors about what happened there, about experiments and treatments that went too far, but no one really knows for sure. The records were all destroyed when the hospital was built. Every night, when I'm mopping the floors, I wonder if I'll see her again. Part of me hopes I don't, but another part of me, the part that can't let go, hopes I do. Because maybe, just maybe, if I follow her again, I'll find the answers I'm looking for. Or maybe, I'll find something much worse. It's crazy what some people will put up with for a little bit of money. Desperate times, I suppose. Well, I am one of those desperate people. Desperation to get my daughter a life-saving medical treatment is what drove me to where I am now. That same desperation has led to daily fear of what might happen next to Danny and I now that it's over. I had no choice I needed money right away. I couldn't qualify for a loan and the insurance company said the treatment was not authorized under our policy. My work was barely paying over minimum wage and I still needed almost five grand. The only way this would work is if I got another job working graveyard somewhere else, at least until I could save enough to get her the treatment. Danny was all I had left. I already lost her mother a year ago in that car crash, I couldn't lose her too. I looked high and low. I combed the classifieds and drove around desperately searching for a job that could pay what I needed and have an available night shift as well. The prospect seemed hopeless, but I had to find something soon. The town we lived in was small and the prospects seemed bleak. That was when in a streak of what felt like luck at the time, I inquired about a job at a small grocery store about a mile away from where we live. It was called, She's Nighttime Convenience and Grocery. It was an odd little store that was closed during the day and seemed to open at around 8 p.m. and close sometime before morning. The weird hours seemed off, and I didn't know who would want to shop at a store that was only open in the middle of the night when there were 24-hour chains elsewhere. Though it did not really matter, it was a store, I needed a job, and the unique hours in this case would work for the schedule I needed. I decided to try and apply for a job there. I was on my way home after finishing a shift at my day job. My friend Kathy was nice enough to watch Danny while I was working, and had even agreed to do so if I found a graveyard shift somewhere else as well, at least for a month or two if needed. Since I had seen the odd shop and saw the hours I decided to inquire about a job at the lonesome and odd little store that seemed to only be open at night. I was reluctant at first since I thought they might have some illicit reasons to only be open at such hours. Despite my misgivings, I realized it was the best hope I had of getting a job with my minimal skill set. 
and that was a guaranteed graveyard shift. I got out of my car and walked up to the entrance. The place was pretty run down but seemed to still have signage up and around the front. There were sale signs and clearance items advertised, and the somewhat normal facade of a grocery store made me relax and continue with my intended course. I noticed up close there was a mark under the first part of the store name, Shiz. It looked like Japanese kanji or something. I stepped inside, and it seemed deceptively large compared to how small it looked on the outside. There were aisles of various groceries and other household supplies, and even some clothes racks. I had no idea how it was this large in operation. Most of the shoppers seemed fairly normal at first, though there were some people who you could tell preferred to do their shopping at night. I tried not to stare as I received a rather murderous looking glare from one such individual who I must have let my eyes linger on too long. The staff also looked about the same as any other store's staff would look. Fairly diverse and no one with an overly cheery or overly sullen mood about them. I did notice there was not a lot of talking near the checkouts. Moving on, I looked near the front, intent on finding a manager's office to inquire at. I felt hopeful when I saw a sign that I thought read, help wanted. I felt a bit confused and less optimistic when I read the full content of the rather strange sign stating, help wanted, but not always needed. I was not sure how to take that, so I decided to look for someone to ask. As I approached the back office and went to knock on the door, I was interrupted by a large man with a blue store apron and a name badge indicating he was store manager, Benny. The large man welcomed me with a pleasant though slightly forced, hello, can I help you find something today? I was distracted by the almost pained expression on his face, like his smile would eventually shatter the muscles in his face if he kept it on for a moment longer. Brushing past the distraction, I remembered why I was there. Yes, I was actually looking to apply for a job here. I stated my earnest intent while gesturing to the help sign near the door. Benny stopped smiling and looked at the sign, and then looked as if he was about to say something when he held up a finger and pulled out a radio from his pocket. Molly, what is the bagger situation today? How are we holding up staff-wise? There was no immediate response. He smiled again in that disturbing way while he drummed his fingers along his tie as he awaited a response. His face wrinkled, and then he stated, I am sorry I think we might be full at the moment, but thanks for your interest. He was about to usher me away when his radio barked to life, and I heard a static-laden voice on the line. I couldn't hear everything but it sounded strange, and I thought I heard something like, Rob, caught, problem, and got bagged. I didn't know what to make of the weird bits I heard, but before I could think twice about it, I heard Benny mumble. All right, but next time answer faster, it could have been a code black, and if you mess around with those customers, it is your ass next. I was still standing there in awkward silence when he wheeled around and his frustrated veneer vanished, and he was back to the awful fake smile as he loudly proclaimed, Congratulations. There is an opening available now, let's get you set up. Can you start tonight? Right now, as in tonight, I asked, thoroughly surprised they would want me to start immediately and without any application or vetting process to speak of. Yes, right now, don't worry we can sort out all the legal stuff later, but for tonight we are actually a bit busier than normal and we could use the help. First though, let's talk terms and some mandatory paperwork. I was not sure what he meant, but I figured it might mean a salary negotiation. Sure, what is the pay and benefits? I knew it was a little tacky to ask up front, but I needed that money badly and Danny couldn't afford for me to get taken for a ride by someone low balling my wages. $45 an hour is the pay for baggers, which is what we normally start people as. I almost gasped aloud. That was crazy for a grocery store bag boy. My surprise was apparent and Benny held up a hand and cut off my next question stating, We value hard work and integrity here and just a wee bit of discretion. He laughed aloud and slapped his knee. But in all seriousness, there is a non-disclosure agreement we do need you to sign with the paperwork. He grinned again, 
and I thought the discretion bit and NDA was weird, but that was double what I was making at my day job, so I was overjoyed at the prospect. He continued, health coverage and dental are fully covered, but no life insurance. Those policies always have some trouble for some reason. His grin widened as he said the last part, and it looked even more fake than before. Despite some disturbing implications, I could scarcely hear the alarm bells in my head over my future payday. I had found a miracle, I would be able to get enough money in about a month working here and my day job. I would be able to get Danny that treatment. I didn't need to be asked twice, I readily agreed to the offer. Very good decision, welcome to the she family. Ed, get out here and get our new hire an apron and a tag and start with a simple version of the bagger training. An unpleasant looking older man emerged from the back room and was holding an apron and moving with an odd gait that might have indicated some previous injury or the like. I forced a smile and introduced myself, but the man, Ed as I heard his name was did not reciprocate. He looked me up and down and snorted derisively in a way that was hard not to take offense to. I let it go and waited for him to say something. Just before opening my mouth to ask when the training started, he cut me off and humorlessly asked, You know Baggin feller. Baggin, like bagging groceries, I tried to clarify. He glared at me and just nodded his head. Well yeah, I mean I have a general idea. I never worked at a grocery store before. But I think I know how things should be bagged generally speaking. He paused an uncomfortably long time and I was about to try and speak again when he snorted and gave a rather unpleasant throaty laugh that ended in a dry coughing fit. After he finished, he said, Not like this, I'm guessing you don't. All right then come on, I will show you how we do the bagging and also the other rules. Reckon you better listen close, I ain't for repeating myself. I nodded my head, and we started towards the back room when I heard the radio on his belt come to life, and a very nervous sounding voice on the other line say, Code black, repeat code black. Ed's face wrinkled in a way that somehow made him look even more annoyed than usual. More of them fellers. He turned and left, angrily shouting some imperceptible grunts and complaints into the walkie, and left me near the back room dumbstruck and not sure of what to do next. What was a code black? Why was everyone afraid of them? I was about to go look for someone when I felt a hand on my shoulder and I wheeled around to see a woman. The tag on her shirt read, Assistant Manager, Molly. She smiled at me and it did seem more genuine than some of the others here. I'm sorry we have not met. You must be the new hire. I'm Molly, the AM here. I can help you with training and orientation. You can be a great asset here at She's. She held a hand toward the backroom doors and ushered me toward them. We moved into the backroom halls, and as I looked around, I saw several doors that looked like ice boxes. I figured they must store a lot of products to need that many freezers scattered about. Visible near the freezer's doors were shelves of other inventory. There were rows of boxes and pallets of strange things like chemicals, metalworking gear, various pieces of hardware and crates that had gun manufacturers' names on them. I was wondering again just what kind of store this really was. Besides the odd inventory, it was also kind of a mess and I was glad I wouldn't be the one having to sort all of it. We made our way to an office room with oppressively bright blue painted walls, like a kindergarten classroom. The sight reminded me of when Danny was in kindergarten, and I steeled my resolve against any difficulty this job might have, I needed to do this for her. The office was sparse, there was only a desk, some chairs and a file cabinet. I did notice on the walls, painted on the bright blue, were some black characters that almost looked like calligraphy. More of those kanji were on the wall and again, I wondered what they meant. Before I could guess Molly was motioning to me. She gestured for me to sit down at one of the only two chairs, in this case the one facing the desk. I sat down and she sat opposite me, she looked over a few pieces of paper she had on a clipboard, and then smiled, turned around and started rummaging through a file cabinet. As I was waiting a sudden shriek was heard outside, and I looked to the door and suppressed a gasp. Molly didn't react and kept looking for something. 
I thought maybe she hadn't heard it, and I was about to say something when she wheeled around with a large binder in hand and dropped it onto the desk with a loud crash. Before training starts, please fill out this form for your safety and ours. She handed me a piece of paper that when reading the details, seemed to be the non-disclosure agreement Benny had mentioned. I thought it was odd I had to sign this, but other hiring documents like tax, payroll and healthcare paperwork were not required before starting. I considered they might be paying people under the table, which I hated to admit I might prefer since no tax deduction meant I could save money faster. I signed all too quickly without realizing what I was agreeing to keep quiet and what the consequences imposed were if I didn't. Molly took the paper, looked it over and said, Good that is settled. Well, let's get started. This is the employee handbook. We only have one, so you are going to be doing some light reading for a bit. Because we need the manpower now though, I will go through it with you quickly, since Ed was indisposed. She grimaced when she said the last word and looked at her watch, and then adjusted a dial on her walkie-talkie. She looked back at me and resumed. As a bagger you are vital in ensuring customers leave satisfied with their product, and you are one of the last people they will see on the way out, except in certain circumstances. She cleared her throat loudly in time to some muffled noise, I thought I heard somewhere else in the back room. Basic rules and code of conduct are as follows. You are to bag products to the customer's satisfaction. The first thing you are to ask customers is what type of bags they want. Whatever they say goes as far as how to bag things and with what bags. You are not to ask about or discuss the purchases of the customers, no matter how curious you are or how talkative they might be. No questions, period. Understood. She slammed her fist on the binder and I jumped back startled as she looked at me. I stammered out a quick acknowledgement. Yeah, I mean yes, understood. Good. She said and continued with the list. No assistance may be provided to customers for loading or unloading things from their vehicles. If a customer requests help to their vehicle, do not under any circumstances assist or leave the building with them or any customer at any time, regardless of the story they give you as to why they need help. It is our policy and they know this. If requests persist or you are feeling intimidated or threatened you are to press the yellow button at the end of each checkout by the bagging station. A security personnel will escort the offending customer to aisle 4 for processing and detainment. Wait detainment. They don't just kick them out. I thought that was weird. She continued with the next rule before I could ask about it. The most important rule. Occasionally there will be a special bag request, you will know it when you hear it. If ordered press the black button by the end of the checkout and proceed with code black protocol. These guests are normally our highest paying customers and often are here at the pleasure of Mr. She himself. They must be attended as quickly as possible. There it was, code black again. What special bag was she talking about? Ignoring the look of concern spreading over my face, she continued. Cell phones, smart watches, or quite literally anything that could be used as a recording device are strictly prohibited while on duty, both for our customer's sake and for our own. Store closes at 4 a.m. exactly. Any customers who remain will be escorted out, only exception being any customers who are involved in a code black. No access is allowed to the basement and inventory backrooms, only managers and stock employees allowed. Simple right, any questions, she asked, while flashing another smile. Well, I did have a few questions about the... She cut me off mid-sentence, talking over me and saying, Good, I knew you looked like a fast learner. Come on, let's get you out to the check stands and bagging. She grabbed my shoulder surprisingly hard and pulled me out of the office and back into the store proper. I saw a few customers look at me getting pulled along, and I saw some snickers and I felt a bit embarrassed. I was led to a checkout with a flickering hash 3 next to it. The other two were busy with customers waiting in line to be helped by a cashier and bagger a few feet away from where I would be standing. We stopped and Molly cleared her throat loudly to get the attention of a young man with dirty blonde hair and a rather unimpressed expression on his face. 
Hello Lee, this is our new bagger. Show him the ropes and try to be easy on him, it's his first day. I know it's busy, but we don't need another rob situation so soon. Have fun you too. She walked away without another word to the back room, and I was left there with Lee, as I heard his name was staring at me. I tried to break the ice. Hi my name is. Save it. He responded abruptly. I don't want to get attached just in case. I liked Rob he was my friend and now, well now it's best not to talk about what happened to him. Just do your job and follow the rules and you should be fine. I didn't know how to respond to the blunt introduction, but I figured he seemed nicer than that Ed guy so I just walked up to the bagging station and gave him a mock salute and tried to put a smile on my face. It was going to be a long night. The first customer came through and Lee wordlessly scanned their items. I proceeded to grab a few nearby bags when I felt a sharp kick in my leg. Lee was glaring at me like I had just slapped his mother. What? I thought I was supposed to. Then I looked at the customer who was frowning at me and I remembered. Hello, what type of bag would you like? The customer, an older woman sneered at me and finally accepted the question and said flatly, paper please, and did her best to pretend I didn't exist while I was bagging her items. Mostly groceries, produce, meat and dairy. There were a few odd pieces like a set of kitchen knives and what looked like boxes of some sort of firearm ammunition. I was about to ask about them when I remembered the rules. I tried to ignore it and just carry on. She left wordlessly and more customers piled into our line. As the night went on, I started to see less normal items and more disturbing things. One customer had bought zip ties, large volumes of what looked like medical grade sedatives and several bags of candy. Another bought an ungodly amount of various weapons ammunition and several large fruits like watermelon and honeydew. I thought he might be just shooting some fruit for target practice until I saw what appeared to be a Kevlar vest and an uncomfortable amount of alcohol. After a dozen very disturbing customers came through I finally found someone who seemed a bit friendly. She was a kindly old woman who seemed to enjoy speaking to me and by all accounts was very nice. It was a much needed reprieve and I actually enjoyed talking with her. Her name was Marge and she was just buying some baking supplies, eggs butter, flour, spices, all pretty normal things. You simply must try my raspberry tart it is divine. I will bring some by next time, or better yet I think I still have some in my car. Won't you be a doll and help an old woman with her groceries? I was about to accept when I saw Lee's face go blank and he just shook his head. I looked back at Marge and she had a wide grin on her face and I looked down at the second half of her groceries yet to be bagged. There were containers of various chemicals including rat poison, bleach and ammonia. I tried to speak but I froze and she asked again. Come on dearie, my hip is in bad shape after my fall. It will only be a moment and you can have a treat and a nice tip as well. Her grin shifted in a way that made me very uncomfortable and I struggled to speak but finally blurted out. No thank you ma'am, store policy. We are not to escort customers out of the store under any conditions. Her grin vanished and grimace of anger flared up briefly. Oh well, your loss I suppose, I would have made it spectacular. I thought I might get one of the new ones before you figured it out. Next time Sonny, I might just find where you live and make a house call. She winked at me and pushed her cart away and I was shocked and horrified at the implications of what had just happened. Lee elbowed me in the side and gestured to the customer who had taken her place, and I was forced to just ignore another uncomfortable encounter that night. After a long shift of bagging goods for an assortment of disturbing individuals, I realized my work was done when a screeching paw system informed everyone in the store that it is now 4 a.m. and we are closing if you have not purchased your items already then you must leave. If you are loading goods, a reminder that no employees may leave with you. You must take them and leave. If you do not, they will be confiscated. Any customers lingering in store will be confiscated as well. Geez, they were not joking about the strict closing time. A large group of people I had not seen before moved through the aisles with flashlights and batons. 
They must have been the store's security team. They seemed overkill and intense, more like paramilitary than grocery store security guards. They were looking for any stragglers, apparently. I thought just then of the weird announcement about people left behind being confiscated as well, and it seemed kind of concerning with how serious they were about everyone getting the hell out on time. I was ushered out as well, along with the other staff who left wordlessly. I tried to make a quip to Lee, asking if there was ever overtime, but he just kept his head down and ignored my joke. I did not know what kind of operation this was, but the more I learned about it, the more I felt like I made a mistake in taking the job. I had to keep it for a while longer at least until I could save enough for Danny's treatment. I worked at Shee's for a few more weeks of uncomfortable conversations and ghoulish and unspeakable items being bagged at the caprice of disturbing and malign customers. I saw two code blacks in that time at least I should say I overheard them. Lee told me not to look and try to avoid the attention of the customers who ordered them. After the first one in my second week of work, I did not see Jay the other bag boy again. Lee warned me not to ask about him, and I was getting increasingly terrified of what would happen if I got one as well. What the hell were the code blacks? The only good news I had was that the store paid bi-weekly, and to my surprise it seemed like almost no taxes were taken out of my paycheck. I had almost a full $2,800 from the first two weeks of work. A little more, and with a bit of the money I saved up from my other job, I could afford Danny's treatment. I just needed to make it two more weeks, and then I could quit and never see the awful place again. I managed to avoid any trouble for my third week, but in my last week I had a disastrous run-in with a customer. It was what started a sequence of events so horrible that the conclusion still threatens my family's safety and terrifies me to this day. It was about 11 p.m. and things were going okay. Some of the managers were poking around, and there was an odd air of concern and anticipation in the air. Lee told me that the owner would be stopping by at some point that night, Mr. She himself. I was trying to ask more about the owner when a large bald man came to our checkout. He had horn-rimmed glasses and a large, jowly face that was fixed in and leering stare that made me feel very uncomfortable. He tried to chat with me, but I got very bad vibes from the man. I tried to ignore him, but he kept pressing it. Ah, come on man, lighten up. I see you are new here, what's it like working here? You see any real action? My response was simply asking, What type of bag would you like, sir? I will show you my bag if you show me yours. He said, then let out a belly laugh that almost knocked his glasses off as he kept smiling at me with a sick gleam in his eyes. After a moment he finally said, plastic's fine I suppose, just trying to lighten the mood. You look tense like you could use a break. I ignored him while bagging copious amounts of junk food, a pair of pliers, lube, condoms and various chemicals like bleach and oxyclean. I had become slightly inured to the worst of the colorful characters and the concerning wares they purchased, but this one seemed particularly loathsome. Yeah, you could definitely use a break. Hey, I know, I can give you a little pick-me-up in my car. I am right outside, help me take this stuff out, and I'm your huckleberry. I couldn't even formulate a response. I couldn't think over my skin crawling away to another zip code. I resolved to just fall back on the rulebook line and proceeded to inform him that we are not allowed to leave the store with customers for any reason. To my horror and disgust this one did not let the matter go. Ah come on, you're just playing hard to get. Seriously, I'm sure I can pay you more than these people. Come on what do you say, come on out and we can talk about it. I repeated the rules again while bagging the last of his items but he would not let it go. Hey listen to me you little f, you think you are too good for me. You think you are some kind of hot shit. Huh. Well you are coming outside now, no one ignores me like this. I have a special treat in store for stubborn pricks who don't listen to me. His face was bright red, and he was practically spitting the words at me. I panicked at first, but then I remembered the button by the bagging station. I pressed it discreetly while trying to hold my ground, shrinking slightly back to the vile tirade of the deranged individual. 
I took a step back and he moved forward, looking like he was going to grab me. To my surprise, a large gloved hand fell on his shoulder. I looked behind him and a nearly seven-foot tall man clad in a weird cross between police riot gear and military-grade armor was holding him back. The customer turned around and started to yell at security. Do you pricks know who the F I am? I know the owner, you will all be sorry you crossed me. I am going to. And a sickening crunch was heard, followed by the man going limp. The guard holstered a now bloodied security baton and bent down over the dazed form of the customer. His eyes were glazed and he likely had a concussion, but he was still conscious and tried to speak when the security guard seized him by the throat and hoisted him back to his feet. The customer tried to whimper out a soft and confused sounding. Wait, wait. Before he was punched so hard in the chest, I thought I heard his ribs break from where I was standing. The helmeted face of the guard turned to me, looked me up and down and asked, what type of bag was he using? I had no idea what that had to do with anything, but I answered, plastic, he was using plastic bags. I heard a chuckle under the mask and helmet of the guard and he said, too bad he didn't pick paper. And the guard dumped out one of the man's bags. As he was trying to rise to his feet, the guard placed the plastic bag around the customer's head and tightened it. To my shock and horror, he proceeded to easily strangle him. I couldn't believe what I was seeing, and after a few moments it was over. I was speechless and another guard came over, and they took the customer's body on a stretcher to the back room. Benny the store manager had appeared out of nowhere and spoke to us. I am sorry you had to see that, but I am glad you are safe. We take threats very seriously here and know you all need to be safe in such dangerous times. That is why we keep this place safe, safe from dangerous people like that. I trust what happened here will also be safe and secure with you right. After all we wouldn't want you endangered by anyone like that knowing where you live right. He smiled at us and left to the back rooms. I understood the veiled threat and realized I would not be able to tell any real authorities or report on this madhouse. Despite that encounter my night was not done yet, and the worst was yet to come. Lee would not speak to me about what we both saw, and we tried to move on with the night and pretend what we saw happen didn't happen. It was getting close to 4 a.m., and we would be able to close soon. I was so close to being done with this place and getting out of there and home to my little girl. I just needed to hang on for a couple more days. There were only a few more customers lining up at the checkouts when something odd happened. A well-dressed man went to check out Hash 2, and they shut off their light and said the scanner was not working anymore. It seemed fishy since it had been fine all night, but when the guarded looks and concerned faces flashed before me, and then back at the well-dressed man, I realized that they might know something I didn't. My heart sank as I realized he might be one of those special customers. I looked over at Lee and he was visibly sweating and fumbling with the cash register. The man sauntered over to out checkout. He had a small basket with what looked like fine sewing thread, thimbles and tailoring articles. It also contained a hacksaw, a plaster cast and several boxes of nails and rivets that seemed to clash with the sewing equipment. By itself I did not think anything of it and I relaxed a bit. Lee was pale and wordlessly scanned the small items he had. After they came down the conveyor the man turned to me, tipped his hat and introduced himself. Good evening my friend. My name is Henry Jaspin. I work for a little antique cloth shop and I am here to get some materials. I relaxed a bit more. This did not seem too strange. I proceeded to ask, what type of bags would you like today Mr. Jaspin? Well, my good fellow, I should think paper for the small bits you see here. Indeed, I found all the tailoring kit I need to make work anyone would be proud of. But what I really need today are some raw materials. So, the bag I really need will be a body bag tonight, preferably the larger variety. My mind was racing, my heart was pounding. Did he just say he needed a body bag? I was about to ask him to repeat it when it dawned on me. The rules had said, a special bag request, you will know it when you hear it. I realized I had just encountered my first code black. 
I forced my trembling body to move, and I pressed the black button under the bagging station. I heard an alert on nearby walkie-talkies. Code black on number three. Confirmations were heard all around. There was a burst of motion near the back, and I handed Mr. Jaspin his bag of smaller merchandise as Benny approached us. Good evening, Mr. Jaspin. He managed to choke out the words, seeming uncharacteristically nervous. Oh, Benny, don't worry, I know what I asked for, and though you are a big fella, I wouldn't dream of picking you, we go too far back. Besides, your skin is terrible, can you imagine one of our suits on you? Mr. Jaspin let out a howl of laughter and Benny followed suit with a nervous chuckle of his own. Your new employee, however, he has a nice strong jaw and broad shoulders. Not as much meat, though. He looked me over and I was confused and terrified at the implication of whatever it was he was talking about. As he was eyeing me, Benny spoke up saying, Of course, you are free to pick as you please, but if I could suggest an option, we just picked up a rather unruly fellow who was just processed a few hours ago, and he is on the larger side. Perhaps he would be a good alternative. Of course, Benny, you and your new hire lead the way. I followed Benny in between him and Mr. Jaspin who was behind us. We went into the back and then through key card locked door that lead into the basement. Benny shot me an apologetic look as we descended into the basement and I beheld what was down there for the first time. The place was very dark and freezing. I thought it might be another type of meat locker, and I was not too far off. When the light switched on, I had to stifle a gasp of shock and horror. As soon as the room was illuminated, I saw it all. We were surrounded on all sides by rows and rows of body bags. Almost all of them were full, corpses leered out of many of them, all in various states of decomposition. I thought I was going to be sick. It looked like a morgue. I realized that we had been dealing with these products the whole time. I laughed quietly to myself in despair when I realized the options were paper, plastic, and apparently body bags. I thought of the conversation of selecting a person. I also thought of the other people who had handled code blacks and had not been seen again like Rob. Rob was bagged. I stood there mouth agape trembling at the horror of the nightmare room before me. While it all unfolded in stark terror to me, Mr. Jaspin calmly perused through the inventory of corpses. He would scrutinize them, pinching a cheek here and there, and giving a tut-tut or moan of disdain. He came across the body Benny had pointed out, and he said, My, my, he is a big fellow. A lot of material they would love to use. Skin is a little dry in places, a touch of eczema. That is all right though, Benny old chum. You have a deal, I will tell Mr. She. Benny sighed in relief and started to guide me out of that nightmare dungeon. While leaving I caught a look at Mr. Jaspin's pick, and I held my hand over my mouth to avoid gasping out loud. It was the belligerent customer from earlier. A large dent on his face from when it was smashed in by security. The face had a deathly pallor and his eyes were still leering, even in death. Why in the hell was he down here in a body bag? And why did it sound like he was just purchased? My mind was grasping for rationalizations for how and why this was all happening. Suddenly Mr. Jaspin caught my hand and proceeded to place a card into my palm. As for you my fine friend, we would love to have a worker like you at our establishment. She runs a tight ship here, but we are a bit more free-spirited at the tailor. Take care and he departed with his horrific purchase. I was ushered upstairs in a daze, and I vaguely heard Benny talking with someone. I snapped back to my senses and saw a new face looking at me. He was an older man, and he had very intense, unblinking eyes that were boring into my soul as I stood there. He spoke to me in a stern but oddly soothing voice. I know you might be unsettled by what you saw, but she knew and the means to access it are natural parts of life. It is what you saw, it is what we sell. We sell it in all its forms. Why, it is even in our name. I hope you understand and do not consider anything foolish over the next few days. We value your work, but understand that some people lack the fortitude to deal with what our business does. Just don't forget that when you head back home to your house on 4th Avenue, 
the large cherry tree at the end of the street is blossoming and looks beautiful, you should take your daughter to see while it still blooms. He placed a hand on my shoulder and squeezed while departing. I had no idea what I had just witnessed, but I knew I was in trouble. My mind was a jumble and besides the imminent threat, I found myself considering something unrelated a name. I thought about what Mr. She had said about she knew and how we sell it. I looked again at the sign as I was leaving, she's nighttime convenience and grocery. I did not think anything of it at first, but I looked closer at the kanji by the first word. Looking up the meaning on my phone I saw it was indeed the kanji for she, sometimes used when counting as the number four in Japanese, but more often associated with something else. The dawning horror and simplicity of the name made sense now. She more often translates to death. I had worked almost an entire month at death's nighttime convenience and grocery. I did not go back, I quit. I will find another way to make the rest of the money I need. My family's safety is what is important now and I know it is not safe for me and Danny here anymore. How could it be? When Mr. Death knows where we live. I'm not really sure how to explain what happened. I don't even know if anyone will believe me, but I have to get it out there. My name is Ethan Graves, and for the past year, I've worked the night shift at Marshall Mannequins, a small factory tucked away in an industrial park on the outskirts of town. My job was simple. Inspect the mannequins, make sure they were flawless, and lock up after my shift was over. It was the kind of work that didn't require much thought, and that was fine by me. I've always preferred working at night. There's something about the stillness, the way the world goes quiet and the air feels different, almost heavier. Plus, it's easier to be alone with your thoughts when there's no one else around. But lately, I've been dreading my shifts. Because something changed, and it started with the mannequins. It was a few months ago when I first noticed it. I was walking down the narrow aisles of the factory, my flashlight cutting through the dim light, and I saw that one of the mannequins had moved. It wasn't a big shift, just a slight turn of the head, but I was certain that when I passed by earlier, it had been facing straight ahead. Now it was looking right at me. I stopped, shining my flashlight directly on it. It was one of the female models, with sleek, shoulder-length hair and a smooth, expressionless face. The thing about our mannequins is that they're almost eerily lifelike. That's part of our selling point. They're designed to look as close to real people as possible, with realistic skin textures and intricate details. But staring into the eyes of this one, I felt a chill creep down my spine. It looked too real, like someone frozen in place, caught mid-gaze. I shook my head, telling myself it was just my mind playing tricks on me. I'd been working late hours, and sleep deprivation does funny things to your brain. I adjusted the mannequin back to its original position, made a note on my clipboard, and moved on. But as the night wore on, I kept glancing over my shoulder, half expecting to see it staring at me again. The next night, it happened again. I was making my rounds, and this time, it wasn't just one mannequin. Three of them had moved. One of the male models, positioned at the end of an aisle, had turned its head slightly, its blank eyes now directed at a door across the room. Another one, a child mannequin, had its arm raised like it was pointing at something on the wall. The last one, the same female mannequin from the night before, was standing closer to the exit than I remembered. It was subtle, but noticeable, as if she had taken a small step forward. I tried to brush it off as carelessness on my part. Maybe I hadn't positioned them correctly during my last inspection. Maybe someone had come in during the day and moved them around. But deep down, I knew that wasn't the case. I'm thorough, almost obsessively so, and I always made sure everything was in its place before I left. That night, I checked the security footage. I'd never done it before because, frankly, there was never a reason to. But I was curious, and a little spooked, and I needed to see if someone was messing with me. I fast-forwarded through the hours, watching the empty aisles and rows of mannequins standing still in the dark. Nothing moved. No one appeared. 
But then, around 2.30 a.m., something flickered on the screen. It was just for a split second, but I could have sworn I saw one of the mannequins tilt its head. I rewound the footage and watched it again, but this time, there was nothing. I turned off the monitor, feeling more unnerved than ever. I decided not to mention it to anyone. What would I say anyway? Hey, I think the mannequins are moving on their own. I'd sound insane. But as the nights went by, the strange occurrences continued, and they got worse. Every time I showed up for my shift, I'd find a mannequin out of place. Sometimes it was a slight adjustment. A head turned, an arm raised. Other times, they were completely rearranged, standing in different spots than where I'd left them. It was like they were playing a game, seeing how far they could push without being caught. And then I started noticing something else, something even more unsettling. The mannequins' faces. They were changing. It was subtle at first, just little differences in the way their eyes were positioned or the shape of their mouths. But the more I looked, the more I realized that they were starting to resemble real people. People I recognized. I didn't know them personally, but I'd seen their faces on missing person posters around town, plastered on telephone poles and pinned to bulletin boards at the grocery store. There was a young woman with curly hair who went missing a few months ago. I saw her face on a mannequin, staring blankly into the dark. A man in his thirties who'd been reported missing last year. His likeness was there too, his glassy eyes fixed on something I couldn't see. And then there was a little girl, her blonde curls perfectly replicated, her tiny hands frozen in an outstretched pose as if reaching for help. I felt sick. This wasn't just a coincidence. Someone had to be doing this, someone who knew these people, who was using their faces to create these lifelike mannequins. I wanted to report it, but I didn't know where to start. What would I say? That I thought our mannequins were somehow connected to a string of disappearances. One night, I decided to take matters into my own hands. I stayed late after my shift ended, long after everyone else had gone home. I had to know what was happening, and I was determined to catch whoever was responsible. I set up my phone to record, positioned it so it had a clear view of the main floor, and then I waited. It was around 3 a.m. when I heard it. A faint, shuffling sound like someone dragging their feet across the floor. I felt my heart race as I crept down the aisle, careful not to make a sound. I could see the silhouettes of the mannequins, their rigid forms standing in neat rows, but there was something else, a shadow that didn't belong. It moved, slowly, weaving between the figures, and as I got closer, I realized it wasn't a shadow at all. It was a man. He was hunched over, his back to me, fiddling with one of the mannequins, adjusting its limbs. I couldn't see his face, but I could tell from his build that he wasn't someone I recognized. I raised my phone, trying to get a clear shot, but then he turned, and I froze. He was wearing a mask. An old, cracked porcelain mask with exaggerated features, a grotesque smile that stretched across his face. But what made my blood run cold was the way the mask seemed to mold and shift, like it was alive, like it was trying to form a different expression. Who are you? I whispered, my voice barely audible. The man tilted his head, and the mask moved, its smile widening. I'm the artist, he said, his voice raspy, almost playful. I make them beautiful. I wanted to run, but my legs wouldn't move. What do you mean? I asked, trying to keep him talking, hoping someone would see the recording and understand what was happening. Why do they look like that? Like real people? Because they are real people, he said, as if it was the most obvious thing in the world. They wanted to be seen, and I gave them a way to be remembered. I felt my stomach turn. You, you did this, you took them. He nodded, stepping closer, and I could see the glint of something metallic in his hand. A scalpel, small and sharp. They were lost, forgotten, he said, almost wistfully. I brought them back, made them perfect. But you, you've been watching, haven't you? You've seen my work. I stumbled back, the mannequins closing in around me, their faces frozen in that eerie, lifelike stare. I wanted to scream to call for help, but I knew no one would hear me. No one would come. 
The man raised the scalpel and I braced myself, but then he stopped, his head cocked to the side as if listening to something. I think it's time for a new piece, he said, and before I could react, he lunged at me. I don't remember much after that. I woke up hours later, lying on the cold factory floor, the mannequins standing around me in a perfect circle. The man was gone, and so was my phone. I staggered to my feet, my head pounding, and ran out of there as fast as I could. I didn't go back, not even to collect my last paycheck. I couldn't. I don't know what happened to that man or where he went. I don't even know if anyone else has seen the mannequins the way I did, but I still see them sometimes. Not in the factory, but in my dreams, standing in that same circle, their eyes following me, their faces smiling that same eerie, lifeless smile. And every time I wake up, I swear I can hear that man's voice, whispering in the dark, telling me that someday, I'll join them. My name is Jared Thompson, and I've been working the night shift at a small, run-down gas station just off Route 62 for the past three years. It's not the kind of job anyone really dreams of having, but it's quiet, and the pay is decent enough to keep me from looking for something else. Plus, after working here for so long, I've gotten used to the late-night solitude. But over the past few months, things have been different. Different in a way I can't quite explain. I'm starting to think I'm not alone here, and I don't mean that in a comforting way. The station itself is your typical middle-of-nowhere setup. Two pumps, a tiny store stocked with snacks, drinks, and cigarettes, and a flickering neon sign that hums above the door. The kind of place you stop at out of desperation when your tank's running low, and there's nothing but miles of empty road ahead. We don't get much foot traffic after midnight. It's mostly truckers and the occasional traveler passing through. That's how it's always been, but recently, the graveyard shift has taken on a much darker, more sinister feel. It started about two months ago. I remember the exact night because it was one of those heavy, oppressive nights when the air felt thick and humid, like a storm was brewing. It was around 2 a.m., and I was leaning against the counter, staring blankly at the security monitors. That's when I saw it. A dark shape moving just beyond the reach of the lights outside. At first I thought it was a person, maybe some poor hitchhiker looking for a ride, but the way it moved was off. I squinted at the screen, trying to get a better look. The shape was hunched over, almost crawling, its limbs moving in a way that didn't seem natural. It skulked around the edge of the lot, keeping to the shadows, and every so often it would stop and look up at the store like it was watching me. The grainy, black and white footage didn't give me much to go on, but there was something about the way it moved that made my skin crawl. I was about to go out there, maybe tell whoever it was to get lost, but then it just disappeared. One second it was there, and the next it was gone, like it had melted into the darkness. I spent the rest of my shift glancing nervously at the monitors, but it never showed up again. I tried to convince myself I'd imagined the whole thing, that maybe I was just tired and seeing things that weren't there. But deep down, I knew I hadn't. Over the next few weeks, the sightings became more frequent. Almost every night around the same time, I'd catch glimpses of those dark shapes lurking around the edges of the lot. Sometimes there'd be one, sometimes more, but they always moved the same way. Low to the ground, slinking through the shadows like they were trying not to be seen. And every time I thought about going outside to confront them, I'd get this overwhelming sense of dread, like my gut was screaming at me to stay put. I didn't tell anyone at first. What was I supposed to say? Hey, I think there are monsters hanging out at the gas station. They'd think I was insane. So I kept it to myself, hoping that maybe it would stop, that whatever these things were, they'd lose interest and move on. But then, one night, something happened that I couldn't ignore. It was a Tuesday, dead quiet, with only the distant hum of the highway breaking the silence. I was stalking the coolers in the back when I heard the bell over the door jingle, letting me know someone had come in. I walked out to the counter, expecting to see a trucker or a late-night traveler, but there was no one there. The door was open, swinging gently on its hinges, 
and a cold draft was blowing in from outside. Hello, I called out, but there was no response. I glanced at the monitors and felt my stomach drop. There were three of them now, dark shapes clustered near the pumps, just standing there, not moving. For a moment, I thought they were people. Maybe homeless or just looking for a place to rest. But as I looked closer, I realized that wasn't right. They were too still, too rigid like statues, and I could barely make out their outlines against the dark. I grabbed the flashlight we keep under the counter and stepped outside, my heart pounding. As soon as I opened the door, the light from the store spilled across the lot, and I saw them clearly for the first time. They weren't people. They were creatures, pale and gaunt, with long, twisted limbs and faces that didn't quite make sense. Their eyes were hollow, black pits, and their mouths stretched too wide, as if their skin was being pulled taut over their skulls. I froze, the flashlight trembling in my hand. They just stood there, staring at me, and for what felt like an eternity, neither of us moved. I was terrified, but I couldn't look away. It was like they were daring me to come closer, to step out of the light and into the darkness with them. And for a moment, I almost did. There was something in their eyes. Something hypnotic that made me want to take that step, to see what they wanted to show me. But then, out of nowhere, a car pulled into the lot, and the creatures scattered, vanishing into the shadows like smoke. The driver got out, a middle-aged guy who looked half asleep, and asked if we were open. I nodded numbly, still clutching the flashlight, and he must have seen the look on my face because he asked if I was okay. I forced a smile, told him I was fine, and rang him up for a pack of cigarettes. As soon as he left, I locked the doors and spent the rest of my shift huddled behind the counter, jumping at every little noise. I knew I couldn't keep this to myself anymore, so the next day I talked to Mike, the guy who works the day shift. I expected him to laugh, to tell me I was being paranoid, but when I described what I'd seen, he got real quiet. Then he told me something I wasn't expecting. You're not the first one to see them, he said, his voice low. A couple of years back, one of the other night guys, Carlos, he quit out of nowhere. Said he was seeing things, things like what you're describing. We all thought he was just losing it, but I guess not. I asked if he knew where Carlos was now, but Mike just shook his head. He moved out of town, didn't leave a forwarding address. But before he left, he said something weird, something I didn't think about until now. He said they weren't just watching him. They were waiting for something. That sent a chill down my spine. Waiting for what? I wanted to ask more, but Mike clearly didn't want to talk about it. And honestly, I wasn't sure I wanted to know. I tried to convince myself that it didn't matter, that if I just ignored them, they'd leave me alone. But the more I ignored them, the bolder they got. One night, I was closing up, and I heard something scraping against the back door. It was faint, like nails dragging across metal, and it sent shivers up my spine. I opened the door just a crack, and there, standing in the alley, was one of the creatures. It was closer than it had ever been, its face inches from mine, and I could see every grotesque detail. The thin, leathery skin, the crooked teeth, the way its eyes seemed to bore into my soul. I slammed the door shut and locked it, but the scratching didn't stop. It got louder, more frantic, like it was trying to claw its way in. I backed away, my heart hammering, and grabbed my phone to call the police. But as soon as I started dialing, the noise stopped, and when I looked out the window, the alley was empty. That was the last straw. I told my boss I was done, that I couldn't work the night shift anymore. He didn't seem surprised. I think he knew something was off, but he didn't ask questions and I didn't offer any explanations. I took a job at a grocery store in the next town over, something with normal hours, and tried to forget about everything that had happened. But I can't forget. Every now and then, I still drive past the gas station on my way home and I swear I see those dark shapes lurking around the edges of the lot, just out of reach of the lights. Sometimes, I even think I see them standing in the shadows near my apartment, watching, waiting. I don't know what they are or what they want, but I know one thing for sure, they're real. And if you ever find yourself driving down Route 62 late at night, 
and you need to stop for gas, do yourself a favor. Keep driving. Don't look back, don't slow down, and whatever you do, don't get out of your car. I have one that immediately comes to mind. I was around 12, staying at my rich aunt and uncle's place, and was home alone in the pool enjoying the sun. No thoughts, head empty. All of the adults and children had gone out for different reasons. But as I was in town visiting, I was just chilling while they were at school and whatnot. It was a bright summer day, not even the afternoon, and I was just waiting around when I simply turned in the water towards the direction of the house. I looked around, doot doot, and eventually looked at the house and saw a full-bodied woman in their piano room glaring at me with her face pressed against the window. It was the second floor of the house. It was the master bedroom, then the piano room, then the kids' rooms. They have a mansion, which is what makes the layout important. The piano room's window was one of those huge multi-paneled ones that may have even been a door opened out to the balcony, but I don't remember a balcony, so I'm pretty sure it was just huge windows. But the things I have and will never forget were her angry expression and her Victorian-esque style. She had dark hair in an ornate bun and a dark ruffled dress, I want to say it was black but it could have been a dark purple or dark blue. She had one of those poof hoop style dresses. I froze then noped and turned the other way and continued waiting in that direction for an hour or however long it took for the adults to come back home. I was staying in the basement at the time but just could not bring myself to go into the house if what I saw was real. I did not dare turn around again because if she was still there F and if she wasn't F. I immediately told the adults when they got back, and my aunt and uncle were like, oh yeah, we have a bunch of shit. Their children's playhouses were on the graves of children. I love them, and I still enjoy visiting them, but I have never slept there since, maybe a visit when I was 16, but I didn't see anything. I was never able to sleep right the rest of the trip though, and I never stayed behind the rest of the trip. Well, I wasn't technically home alone, but I was the only one awake at the time. Just happened about three or four months ago. I wasn't feel well and had difficulty sleeping, so I was awake and kinda tired, which is 100% the reason why it happened. Still freaky af though. I went downstairs, it's around 2 a.m. to use the bathroom. I went into the kitchen afterwards, stopped for a moment to stretch and yawn, and could clearly see from the corner of my... I someone it uh, kind of looked like Slash from Guns N' Roses standing about 15-ish feet away in the living room to my right. I was like WTF looked, but they disappeared. While trying to process what the hell I just saw, someone grabbed me on the back of my neck, like a full-on grip. I run back upstairs and didn't come out of my room until 9am. So that another weird thing that weirdly also involves me not feeling well and difficulty sleeping. This happened about 20 years ago when I was around 17 or 18. I wasn't feeling well all day and my mom was naturally concerned. I also had difficulty sleeping, so I'm laying in bed around 3 a.m. listening to the radio when all of a sudden I hear my door open and the latch on the door catch. I sleep with my back to the door so I couldn't see who it was and naturally just assumed it was just mom checking up on me, so I went to get up and let her know I was alright when all of a sudden I was gripped by fear. My entire body was screaming, Danger! Danger! Don't move! So I listened and absolutely did not move. About two minutes later a full song, the door closed again and the feeling went away. Stranger kept trying to open my door, then started whispering to let him in. So that additional info, as it is somewhat important. First of all, I'm biologically a female, 5 foot tall, 24 year old at the time, but getting mistaken for a teenager all the time babyface plus tiny frame. Second of all, I live in Europe so no guns for me. Enjoy. So the encounter took place few years ago. I was living in a super huge apartment block and quite shitty one. One late afternoon I was just chilling with my then girlfriend when I suddenly heard faint, scratching noises outside of the door. Definitely weird, but I dismissed it, thinking it's probably some neighbor kiddos scratching walls with a key or some other stupid stuff kids sometimes do. A moment passed and the noise didn't disappear. Quite the opposite, it got louder. At this point I started realizing what is that sound. 
it was a sound of a metal object scratching on my door's lock. I immediately got startled and went to look via the peephole. The long corridor was half dark, and right there in front of my door there was a man. I couldn't see his face too clearly, but I was 100% sure I don't know him. He was tinkering with the lock in some way, but with the peephole's limited field of view, I couldn't see what exactly he's doing. I made sure all my locks are, well, locked and backed off as it fell silent, just as I was about to return to the living room. The door handle slowly moved down, pressed from the other side, and just as slowly returned to its initial position. I got him freaked. I hurried to the kitchen, grabbed the biggest knife I had, and squatted next to the door. It was locked, but if he managed to pick it. Well, there I was, frightened and armed. For a moment, it fell silent again. Then the lever slowly went down and up again. More scratching, and the lever moved again. Then silence again, and then I heard a whisper. Let me in. My heart skipped a bit, or a dozen of them, probably. Let me in, let me in. If he was screaming, it would be as frightening, but he wasn't. He was whispering to my door repeatedly. Let me in. I think I unfroze for a second because I grabbed my phone and called the security. The apartment block had the security, but they were stationed in a small booth outside of the block itself, which was huge, and I lived on the eighth floor, so it was a really long way to get there from their place. Especially given that they were lazy bastards who usually just watched TV and smoked so much there was a heavy fog inside of the booth. Still, I gave them a panicked call, quickly explaining the situation. Sure enough, the guard laughed it off, saying the stranger is probably just some drunk neighbor. He told me that THW other guard is on the patrol, and that he'll call him and tell him to come to my door. I have no idea why I didn't call the police, but I was probably just too frightened to think straight. The block was in the middle of nowhere, so the nearest police station was quite far away anyways. My girlfriend just kept observing, probably some kind of a stress reaction too. Seconds felt like hours. After some time, it fell silent, this time for good. Fifteen minutes later or so, the freaking security guy finally knocked on my door, long after the guy was gone. Good job, man, seriously. Took your sweet time, thank you very much. He said they will close the gate and check the camera footage. But he didn't look too tense, so I don't know if they actually did that. To this day, I have no idea what happened. Maybe it was some drunk neighbor who left the elevator one floor too early or too late and thought his wife locked him out. Maybe he was some psycho or a junkie trying to purposefully access my door. I will never know. I guess I prefer it this way. For your information, I didn't see him ever again. The block itself so big that it was actually a neighborhood on its own imagined sweet home, but triple that size started getting worse and worse and finally we moved out. But not before having few more experiences like that. Let me know if you want to hear more stories from my personal sweet home real life scenario. Part 2. So just to provide you with some background as you probably know by now, the apartment block was huge. If you watched Sweet Home, imagine that block but triple the size and you get a good image of my block. It was in a very empty part of the city, pretty much a middle of a small nowhere, with barely any buildings around. Initially when I moved in, the place was rather nice. It was my second own apartment, and the first one in a decent shape, so I was happy I could get it for a good price. Then developers started building a very nice, new neighborhood next to it and people started moving out perhaps getting new apartments in those new blocks, as this one was very cheap. Well, less decent people started catching the deals and moving in, and the place spiraled down to hell, with trash bags, empty alcohol bottles, and suspicious pools appearing in the halls and stairways. And then there was the people. Zell storm of noise and playing football at home. In the apartment right above, there was a family with small kids. They argued a lot and damn, it was loud. They didn't even bother actually sending the kids to school because, despite the children sure being at least seven or eight, never seemed to leave the block. They would stampede around the apartment, jump and scream, from 6 a.m. to 11 p.m., and sometimes even past midnight he was in my final year of university, so I barely had any lectures anymore, mostly studying from home. They would actually jump so hard my ceiling light and, and glass stored on the shelves would rattle. A lot. I tried, of course, knocking on their door to ask them to keep it a little bit down. 
Half of the times they wouldn't answer the door, the other half they would lie there at work with the kids being dropped at their grandma's. Yeah, of course. Must be them ghosts throwing a wild party in your place when you're out. And yeah, I was 100% sure it was coming from their place. I was desperate enough to listen at the door. So, and the kids would keep playing football around the house. Yup. Imagine the level of noise with a ball being kicked and smashed on the floor just above my head. I tried to talking to them about that. They shouted at me that they're not going to take the ball away and ruin their kids fun and closed the door in my face. Being out of options and hearing the kids never leaving their house, along with all the crazy arguments, me and my GF mailed a child service with honest description of everything that was happening. Well, the service sure must have paid them a visit. Because few days later, in the late evening, the male neighbor appeared in front of our door, banging and spamming the doorbell like crazy. It obviously didn't work, so she started talking to us through the door, demanding that we open it and face him, calling us names, then demanding to talk again and claiming he won't hurt us, won't do anything to us, etc. 100% convincing, especially when intertwined with being called bitches, etc. It took him at least 30 minutes of literally keeping the doorbell pressed and talking to us before he finally gave up. Not that it helped. The situation didn't change a bit. Sandom night calls. I would keep random night calls on my door phone. At least one, two times a week. Someone would call my door phone at 1 or 2 a.m. Never answered, I've always been terribly scared of strangers and home breaches. It sure didn't help with my fears, so I have no idea WTF was going on. Speaking of home breach, at some point, a letter from some resident appeared on the ground floor's dashboard. She was in her apartment, and while the door was closed, it wasn't locked. Somebody sneaked in while she was there in the living room and stole valuables from her purse that she left in her corridor. She was looking for any possible witnesses. The halls her security cameras guessed they were there just for a theater. Similar thing happened to a woman whom I met on the elevator. Somebody heavily scratched and ruined her car when it was parked in the apartment block's guarded car park. Adds to my theory of the cameras not even working, and the most fun part that finalized our thoughts of moving out. The block had one elevator for each wing, total three. You could reach my apartment from two of them. Of course, since the place went to hell, there wasn't a single week when at least one of them wouldn't be broken. Sometimes both were. The machinery wasn't at fault. Most usually, the button panel would be smashed or kicked in, or the call button, or the elevator's ceiling would be torn down. So we have a friend who's a police officer. He was planning to give us a visit in one evening. Sure enough, the elevator was broken, and he didn't know where the other one was, so he climbed the stairs. Now the stairs would go around the shaft, so part of the stairway was hidden behind it, and as the place was huge, the stairs were rarely used by anyone. With some delay, he finally knocked and our door, quite astonished. Turned out that while climbing the stairs, he met junkies injecting themselves behind the shaft. Well, unlucky for them, he's a cop, and he was more than happy to do this job. But imagine if someone who's not an officer met a bunch of drug addicts injecting themselves on your block stairway. I guess that was the thing that finalized our thoughts of moving out. It went from grungy to slummy to straight out scary and dangerous. The place had cameras, but I doubt they even worked proof above in security that wasn't any better. I've had a few creepy things happen to me in my life, but this one I still think about how things could have went wrong very fast. I'm a 20-year-old female. This takes place back when I used to live in southern Indiana like seriously in the sticks. It was a weekend night and my best friend and I were coming home after our graveyard shift at a local waffle joint. She decided to get her dog from her house so we could stay at my place for the night. That's important later. So we start heading out into the country while I live, and to get to my house there's a long narrow dirt road you have to go down. About a mile in or so we see a truck's headlights. We get closer and it's a nice truck, probably like a tween 18 at least. I can't say I know much about cars, leave me alone lol, he's parked to where he's sideways, blocking the whole path. Confused, I get out and ask if he's okay. He looked hopeful when he saw me at first. I'm just waiting on a friend to come get me, my truck stuck. He smiled at me, and I noticed his pupils were nearly completely dialed at. He looks back to my car and sees that I have someone with me, 
and he looks at the dog sticking his head out the window. His smile fades. He says, pit bulls are mean and nasty. He quickly turns around and gets back in his truck. I go back to my friend and I'm like, put this shit in reverse and use whatever hood race skills you have to get us out of here. So we take my poor 95 caddy that really shouldn't be driving on a dirt road anyway and back all the way up down that road and get back to the main road. Relieved, we take a different road home. Then, lo and behold, the same guy is parked on that road standing off to the side smiling, just looking into our headlights. We were completely about to shit ourselves and we gunned it the rest of the way home. I don't know how he got there before us or what his intentions were, but I'm thankful I wasn't alone being my naive college girl self. When I was 18, 19, I lived in Buford, Georgia, alone I had separated from my husband at the time in 1991. I worked at a convenience store and lived alone in an awful trailer. Being from the north, I wasn't used to the heat, so I took to taking walks for air exercise late at night early in the morning between 11 p.m. and 2 a.m. I'd stop to watch this band practice in an open shop in a strip mall, and just meander around until I felt like sleeping, then I'd walk home. One night, I realized I was being followed by a cop car. Didn't think much of it. It happened a few more times until one night the car pulled up next to me, and this mid to late twenties handsome blonde cop asks me if I wanted a ride home. When I refuse, he starts asking me what I'm doing out so late, where I'm going, etc. From the time that cop car pulled up alongside me, the deep gut alarm bells were going off in every cell in my body. So I'd never feared cops before this, I was a quiet white chick who was raised in the time of, cops are your friend and will protect you. But this guy had my, my heart in my throat. I've only ever had this reaction to one other person. I stayed as calm as I could on the outside and answered his questions. I had to refuse his offer of a ride home two more times in the conversation I stayed as far as I could from his car door. I never took another walk late at night again. The time when cops would be invited to schools to give talks about how drugs are bad, and you should always tell the police everything and be honest with them, and if you are in trouble or scared, just find a cop, and they will protect you and keep you safe. Unassuming, unremarkable truck driver came through my work last year who just sent the willies through me same freaked out feeling for no apparent reason again. Listen to your gut. I worked at a place that had a hotel in K halls and restaurant. I was young and friendly to everyone. I was friends with some of the of my co-workers while others it was more of a passing hello. I worked most nights after school and weekends so I was always there for special events such as Mother's Day brunch and holiday parties at the premises and I'd dress accordingly. One Saturday morning I come into work and a concerned panicked front office manager FOM asks to speak with me. He starts questioning my interactions with his son S who worked in another department within the hotel. Now his son was not someone I'd consider a friend more of an acquaintance. I knew his name and he was more of a friend of another co-worker T, and to be honest S was a little awkward. I was still friendly, but I didn't interact with S beyond a greeting. Kifoem asks if I had plans to meet S the previous night. I say no. He then asks if I ever said anything about marrying S. I again say no and now I'm really confused. Turns out S had mental issues that were made worse with drug use. I'm not sure if his parents knew the extent of it either but the previous night they found out. So his dad told me in a panic that they found him in his room playing loud music under a blanket rocking back and forth really late at night. Under the blanket he had a backpack with rope, knife, and drugs. His parents, obviously scared, asked what he was doing. He said that he was going to meet me that night and were getting married. They tried to talk logically to him since my name hadn't ever been mentioned in their home until that point. When the logical approach didn't work, they were forced to call the police, as ended up in a mental institution for several months. Fawn was pale and looked like he hadn't slept much. Needless to say, I was scared at how improbable and scary in my eyes at least this whole thing was. I had no idea. It caused a big commotion and from that point forward S was banned from the premises and I was escorted to my car every night. I spoke to my friend T that day and he tells me that this same night S was trying to convince him to come out of his house because he wanted to talk to him. When T didn't go out, he started yelling at him to stay away from me. 
T thought that was weird, but didn't think anything of it because, like I said, S was a little weird, but never violent. S had his backpack with him, too. Sis eventually got out of the mental institution, but I was never told. Unfortunately, I got a little lax and didn't notice that he followed me home one day. He waited until I was home alone and knocked on my door. I opened the door without looking through the peephole and I froze. He asked to talk to me and I couldn't think of a reason to give, but I knew I didn't want him inside my house. I went outside because in my panicked thinking, I could outrun him or play nice so he'd leave. This tells me that he's much better and in school. Now there is no way that he was in school because it was the summer he was an older high school student so his best bet was a GED. Then he rambled about what I wore to Mother's Day brunch two years prior. He asked if I still had the dress he wanted to ask me to dinner, but I made up an excuse of working and talked about his dad who still worked at the hotel. Thankfully he left. The next time S came to my house, my brother came out and threatened him to never come around. I saw him a few more times driving around my area and I hid. I'm not sure what became of him, but I was terrified for a long time of being followed. It did not help that I had two other stalkers in my early 20s, but those are stories for a different time. I'll end with saying that it does not matter what you look like or what actions you took or didn't take. If someone fixates themselves on you, it is not your fault. I am considered attractive by most standards, but I really hate that I hid myself and became an introvert because I didn't want to be seen. I changed the way I dressed and avoided eye contact. I'm sharing this little story here because honestly, I still feel very uneasy because it didn't really end. I make two trips to school in the morning dropping off my kids, then I come back for more neighborhood kids. This morning, my son wanted to wait and go with the neighborhood kids, so he was left behind while I ran my daughter, daughter and I drove out of our driveway. It was still dark and we're talking torrential rain coming down. I almost didn't see this man in the street until I was right up to him. Middle of the street, yelling, making wild gestures, looking angry. He actually looked very clean-cut though healthy, even good-looking. But he gave me an instant bad vibe, especially just one block from where my son was home alone. He looked me straight in the eyes and screamed gibberish like he was enraged. Hurried to drop off my daughter, then went back for son and the neighbor kids. I told them about the guy, but all was well, no sign of the stranger by then. Fast forward to this evening. I had forgotten all about it. Daughter and I went to library, son opted to stay home. After library we were sitting in the drive through and my son texts to tell me there's a man running around the neighbor's yard across the street, screaming his head off acting crazy. Then someone pulled up and started filming the guy. I told him, I'm on my way if he comes near the house, call 911. I was home within minutes and the guy was gone, but there were five police cars on my block looking for someone. Obviously, a neighbor must have called. My son and I compared descriptions of the man we saw, and it's gotta be the same guy. It's driving me crazy not knowing what's going on. Or if he's out there. Or if we're safe. So I was 16 at time. I met Tom by my classmate who was goth. He had his own band and all plus everyone considered him as the type of person who is dangerous. Though to be honest, he was the sweetest person I've ever met, so I didn't really verify what kind of vibe Tom, his guitarist, was giving me of. I just assumed that if my friend was sweet, his friends must be sweet too, which in most cases was the truth. Tom was shorter than me, I'm 5 foot 7, so it's not that uncommon in my case, and had really long blonde hair and because of that many people has misgendered him. He was nice and funny, though he wasn't exactly the type of person with whom I'm hanging out with most of my friends are loud extroverts with a lot of energy, and even more memes saved on their phones. Me, my friend, and Tom was going to the same school, so when I was talking with my friend, Tom was usually there too. After some time me and Tom started to spending more time alone, and he somehow became one of my friends. Please mark, that I have told him a lot of times about my crush, so he definitely knew I was interested in someone else. Time has flew by, and my best friends started noticing that Tom is evidently interested in me. I just laughed it off and didn't think much of it. Me and Tom, oh come on guys, 
so I didn't believe them. I wanted to make sure that Tom knows what kind of intentions I have towards him. So despite the fact that I'm a really cuddly and friendly person, I tried to not show him so much attention anymore. Months flew by and here February came in. Despite the fact that my friends have told me about some red flags, that he was watching me, that he magically appeared everywhere we went, he followed us around, etc. I again so naive and dumb thought that it was established for good, that we are friends. No need to say, my friends were not a big fans of him. So, when he invited me for shopping after school, I was like, yeah, sure. Day before, he had texted me about how he was excited for going out, etc., and offered me a lift home after. I have told him that no, I'm okay with bus, I live in a next town, not too near, not too far. He insisted. He was so peristant in giving me a lift home that my naive though aggressive and assertive ass texted him, Bitch you right, I'll give you a ride home one more time and we're not going anywhere. So he finally stopped. I really hate guys who don't take no for an answer. And it was definitely the case here. The meeting was nice, but... Weird. You know around 15 minutes after we got to the shopping center, I knew he wanted something more I'm naive, not blind. So after some awkward time I said I got to go. I have went to the bus stop he wanted to walk me there, and that was about it at least that's what I taught. He got on the bus with me because apparently he was going the same way. I knew that he lived in the other part of the city, but maybe he needed to do something there. Though I knew that something was off, so I have got off the bus a few stops before mine and called my mum. He got off too. I asked him why is he following me, and he said that he wants to make sure I'm getting home safely. Yo, what the f dude? Do you think it's romantic? I told him to go home, but he was persistent. I've told him that yesterday I've texted him that I'm okay with coming home alone, and he said, but you are coming home by yourself. What's the problem? So literally scared and really uncomfortable, I have read way too many true scary stories. I got that feeling on my spine that his intentions are not pure. It was getting dark and I was alone with him in the middle of nowhere, and he started to make his move. In this moment, I started being more annoyed of him than scared. I'm a tall, sporty girl with a blue belt and after boxing classes, so if he tried something I would beat the shit out of him. At least my voice is really loud and I scream louder than an ambulance. Then I remembered my um, dangerous meeting with some old creep who wanted to do you know what he failed, don't worry. I was so freezed that for the first 10 seconds I couldn't move or even make a noise. So I decided it wasn't necessarily the best place to turn him down. So we just waited silently, I would definitely feel more safe alone than with him. He started touching my back and hair etc, and when I asked him to stop he just said, Sawa, you are so cute when you're angry. Sued no means no. I've told him that, and he started making monologue about how girls always say no, but they mean yes. No they don't. And then it was so dark that I had to turn my flashlight on. He asked me if I was cold. I said that no, but apparently we're talking about a guy who don't take no for an answer, and so he hugged me tightly. I tried to push him away, but then I remembered that night when I was almost you know what and I again freezed. I felt him sniffing my hair and neck. His hands was tightly hugging me. He was way stronger than I thought. I felt his slow breath on my skin. So you really are perfect, he said after a while with changed voice. It was deep. I felt like a rabbit caught by a fox. I laughed hysterical and started crying, but he was still holding and sniffing me. So when my mum came I've run to her car. She has thankfully parked away from the bus stop, so he couldn't ask himself to my home even if he'd wanted. When I got home I started crying my eyes out. I thought it was over after that. I have definitely limited acquaintance with him. He still was a friend of a friend so I didn't want to make a big deal out of it. And then lockdown came in so I thought that problem is solved. Notice that I have alarmed my mum about this, but she said that he just likes you, and oh come on, boys will be boys, so I was alone with my problem. He was calling me a few times per day, and when I asked him why no, I wasn't answering calls, he texted me that he wanted to talk because he missed my voice. As a dumb bitch I were, I taught that ignoring him will make him stop. And surprisingly it worked. At least the texts and calls stopped. So when we came back in September, he was acting like in September year ago, a pure nice shy dude. My goth friend was expelled from school at the time, and we kind of lost contact so I couldn't talk about Tom with him. 
maybe Tom just acts this way. I don't know, I know some clingy people who would totally do the same things as Tom, but with the purest intentions. Yes, I am a naive dumb bitch. And then the lunch break came. So after everyone from our table left, only me and Tom stayed, I eat rather slow, and he was drinking his juice. It's a nice thing we finish the lessons at the same time at Thursdays, he said. We can hang out then. Maybe go ice skating when the winter will come. Have some sushi or STH. So, first of all, my school has a private lesson plan for each class, so you can't just check it on the website. The teacher needs to send you it, plus I didn't give it to him, so how TF did he know? Second of all, I love ice skating. I've told him that a year ago, the day we met, how did he remember? And finally, I have never told him that I like sushi. Why would he ask me to got here if he wasn't sure I liked it? A lot of people hate sushi. Even I eat it only occasionally with my friends. And then it hit me. My friend told me that he was following us. He knew I liked sushi because he saw us eating it. Probably several times. Maybe I have told him after all. Just for God I tried to make an excuse for him. But I started to feel so scared I couldn't move. Haha <laughs> yeah. I answered awkwardly, trying to make my voice sound normal. H how do you know? He started to look a little bit uncomfortable and changed the subject. It's okay, this is way too suspicious. I have told about it my best friends. One of them, Hannah, said. OMG, yes, I remember now. After that, I taught that she for some reason has sent him it. So I felt relieved. I have met him today at the principal office. He was taking our class plan. I taught it's pretty weird too. I wanted to tell you this since you guys are friends and all, but I forgot, sorry. See? What? Okay, now if he wanted to be friends, he would just ask me about it. And if he knew that I wouldn't give it to him, why he was so persistent. Okay, we need to get this clear my friends taught the same. I confronted him a few days later. I have told him that we can't be more than friends ever. I like someone else. I don't have romantical feelings towards him, etc, etc, of course, in a nicer words. After my monologue, he was just standing there. After a while, he said, I knew about it. He looked at me. You did like my touch, though. I saw you liked it. So why are you acting like this? I've told him that I didn't. It made me very uncomfortable. That even then I tried to push him away, but I couldn't. And that if a girl says no, she means no. Well, he said, it seems like I am stronger than you after all. Good thing to know. Well, be happy that I won't use it on you. You are too pretty. So we just stood there, me in shock, he just looking at my reaction. And then my next class started, so I went away. When I've looked back, he was still standing there, with this blank expression on his face. Then he looked up and our eyes met. He seemed sad and angry. So after that, we stopped talking for a while. Though I could see him in a very weird places, staring at me like in a building where I train karate or my bus stop. He never took this bus stop. He lives in a completely different direction, but also this stopped after some time but here my so-called best friend Hannah turns in. She became friends with him knowing what kind of relationship me and Adam had. I was trying to tell her to stop asking him to hang around with us, but she didn't care. Also, every time that our choir needed music, help she texted him to help us since. So come on, Essie, it's my name. He's so good with guitar, he can totally help us. The so Seacound locked one had came in, and I don't know what to expect when I'll come back. The worst part is I know that he's a good person. He will get over his feelings, at least I hope so. But I think it's just cruel for Hannah to ask him to hang out with me and her, because then it looks like I asked her to do it, to play with his feelings or use him. I know that she likes him also not in a romantical way as far as I know, but come on girl, don't do this to me. Can't you hang out with him alone? I don't know what to do. I will also keep updating if something happens, which I highly doubt so. We haven't spoken in a half of a year, he acts normal. We texted just once to share each other experiences about musical I have recommended him in September. But I'm happy I had ended it before something bad happened. And I hope that nothing bad will happen too. Tom, I know that we will meet again. So let's just meet as a normal friends. With nothing more to it. This is a little bit hard to explain but I will give it my best shot. With every near-death experience I have had, and I have had a lot, 
I always see the exact same place with the exact same person next to me. Altogether, I have had maybe six experiences like this since I was a child, the first being when I was about five. The first time I remember, I was standing in the middle of what looked to be a brightly lit carnival, smack in the middle of a large field of tall grass that stretched further than I could see. The sky was this inkai dark blue hue that wasn't scary at all, considering I hated the darkness back as a kid. I remember walking next to somebody, someone who feels like a total stranger but not uncomfortable to be around. For the life of me, I couldn't seem to turn my head to look at their face. Instead, I stared at a large blue bouncy house light that many children were going down, having the time of their lives. Where it ended, I couldn't see. All I knew is that I wanted to go. I had to go down it. An unexplained impulse told me to climb up and throw myself down it, take me wherever it went, but I also felt like I was compelled not to, as I ended up getting treated for a head wound sustained from falling down a flight of concrete stairs. The next few times, whether from drowning to being stabbed, every single time I went back to that same place, feeling that I existed in this place however I currently was. Age, hairstyle, you could name it. I have asked every family member I could think of if they remember such a place that they might have taken me, but all of them said no. The latest was less than a year ago when, one night, I unknowingly went to sleep with a very bad concussion that I might not have opened up from, sustained during my latest and final football game played in my freshman year of high school. I woke up around 3 a.m., and before I could even rise to my feet, I felt a terrible pain lash out in my head and I passed out. This time, when I went back to this place, I finally saw the face of the stranger that I had been with throughout the years. More than that, I felt a pretty happy, unexplainable joy that caused me to do some sort of ballroom dance with them. But then I had to leave. I don't remember if it was because of something they said or something in the outside world, but once again I woke up separated from whoever or whatever that was, and I felt instantly sad for what feels like a ridiculous reason. So along with that, I lost all memory of what that person looked like, which made me feel even worse. What's weird is that I don't dance ever. I never have, and it would take some serious bribery to get me to do so. But in the dream, I was just really dancing like it was something I did all the time. I have to say, it was probably one of the highlights of my life, oddly enough. I don't have any clue as to what's going on, but I think that maybe I have encountered my personification of death. Like maybe we each have something or someone that comes to visit us when we are about to die. Maybe it's the same person or maybe it's individual to each. All I know is that I have this odd feeling that this time wasn't my last time visiting them or in that place. It's okay, so this was years ago when I was around 17, 18. This was around 1995. I was at home studying for my matric finals. This means the last year of high school. I was sitting in my parents' bedroom which has large wall-to-wall -wall windows which look out onto the front garden. At that time our front garden was all made out of concrete displays and rockeries with a lot of succulent plants. This was a remainder of when my grandparents had owned the property. This is an important detail to point out. I was sitting there, studying when all of a sudden I see this woman working in the garden. I was the only one there as my parents were working and my brother was still back at the school at that time. I'm very curious and obviously quite scared to see this woman there, but I rub my eyes to clear them, thinking that I must be tired from studying. I look out the window again and she was still there. I look back up and she is still there. She was a petite woman, maybe in her early thirties, wearing a white shirt with tan-colored slacks. Her hair was short, but not in a masculine way, and was a deep shade of brown, almost black. I got up to go to our front door to approach her. Mind you, she would have been out of my sight for only a few seconds as I walked to the door. I opened the front door, and when I looked outside, she was gone. I went into the garden to have a look around, even down the little side alley that almost runs down the length of our entire house, but she was nowhere to be found. Later, when my mom came home from work that night, I told her what I had seen and what this lady had looked like. My just looked at me more a few seconds saying nothing. My mom took a deep sigh and told me to follow her into her bedroom. From the top shelf of her cupboard she brought down a shoe box. In this box were various small trinkets, a few very old and faded photos and the thing that she was looking for. 
results, it was a newspaper article about a murder that had happened in our house in the 1940s. A woman had secretly sold her baby on the black market for 500 pounds. Her husband didn't know that she had done this, and when he came home from work, which I would assume was later that day or night, he saw that the baby wasn't there. He also noticed that all of the baby's things weren't there either. So when he asked his wife where the baby was and the baby's stuff was she confessed that she had sold their baby. In a fit of rage, the husband beat and stabbed his wife to death because of what she did. He did it in the house that we are still living in today. It's unclear how he was caught for her murder as the article just said that he was. He was pressed about where he buried his wife, but he never said where he did it. The picture in the article was a picture of his wife with the same dark hair, wearing the same shirt I saw her wearing and the same slacks. My mom said that she never told us about it for two reasons. One, we were still young and didn't need to know the story, she said. Two was because she didn't want to scare us into thinking that we have ghosts. You know how kids are if they hear something like that and may become scared for nothing. The incident still makes me wonder today why she wanted me to see her that day. No one else had seen her and I had never seen a picture of her before then. It was an extra note to this story. I live in South Africa in a place that was heavily mined in the 30s and 40s. This place is Johannesburg and is called the City of Gold because of the reefs of gold that run one thousands of kilometers under the surface, especially at that time when gold was in abundance. A lot of Irish miners came here to work on these mines. The houses built in the town where I still live were built for those miners back in the day. This couple were one of the Irish that came here so the husband can work on the mines. When I was like 13, 14 years old, I headed off to bed and went to sleep. Well, my mother swears she was woke up in the middle of the night, and she didn't know by what so she got up to check locks on doors and such and just make a round through the house. When she passed my room, she saw lights flickering through the crack under the door like I had the TV on, and she said, When I come back by, you better have that TV off and be in bed. It was like 3 a.m., and I had school in the morning. Well, when she came back around, the lights were still on, so she burst into my room ready to yell at me and says it was pitch black and I was sound asleep. She asked me about it the next morning, and I had no idea what she was talking about. She said it was the strangest thing because the lights visible under my door were bright and flickering, but as soon as the door opened they were just gone. I also slept with blankets over my windows to keep all the light out so there wasn't really anything that could have caused the phenomenon. Thanks for listening. If you like our work, do subscribe because your support helps us keep this channel alive.